My name is Danny Forster, and this is Build It Bigger. As an architect, I travel the globe investigating some of the most important buildings in the world. And right now, I'm going to take you inside one of the largest developments in the Middle East. Abu Dhabi's Central Market. The centerpiece of a staggering $200 billion effort to build a new downtown for this 250-year-old city. At its base, one of the world's largest traditional Arabian markets, wrapped in some of the most expensive materials on the planet. Every time it goes over a little bump, you get this worry that it's going to snap. Complete with a state-of-the-art retractable roof. This doesn't look anything like our shopping malls in New Jersey. Yes. Above the market, three towering glass skyscrapers, all topped by the most complicated roofs ever attempted. I'm not entirely sure how we're going to pull this off. Including the tallest residence ever built, soaring 1,250 feet up to the highest swimming pool on Earth. Bring us in. <laughs> the wind is gusting so hard. We are so high right now. I'm in Abu Dhabi, one of the richest cities in the world. This is the capital of the United Arab Emirates. Located along the southern tip of the Persian Gulf, Abu Dhabi. Buried beneath its sand, over 95% of this country's oil. It was in December of 2009 when a massive economic crisis hit the Middle East. Banks defaulted, thousands of companies closed their doors, and millions of square feet of new construction projects were halted in their tracks. While its neighbor Dubai is crippled by a $100 billion debt, oil-rich Abu Dhabi is expecting over 2 million new residents to move in, creating a housing crisis. Now, Abu Dhabi has decided to press ahead with one of the largest construction projects in the world. They're building a new downtown. At the center of their $200 billion plan, Central Market. A new 5.3 million square foot city in the heart of their 250-year-old downtown, packed into a narrow four-block radius, three blade-shaped glass towers soaring over the existing skyline. An office, a hotel, and the tallest residence ever constructed all connected at their base by one of the largest traditional Arabian markets on the planet. Abu Dhabi is a place where you respect your traditions, but you're not locked inside of them either. Our heritage is important, our uh, past is important, but it's not about nostalgia, it's about now. And being modern means you have to have a city that evokes your past, but does not copy it. When designing Central Market's three ultra-modern skyscrapers, world-famous architect Lord Norman Foster was also careful to consider the city in which they stand. What's so great about the Central Market Towers is that both the top and the bottom are connected to Abu Dhabi. The base is inspired by the history the traditions of the Middle East, whereas the design of the top of the building is related to the sun. Each glass tower is cut on a sharp 50-degree angle Clad with specifically designed solar panels, this angle allows maximum exposure to direct light as the sun tracks from east to west. A groundbreaking design that can power 5,000 homes, but makes these roofs the most complicated ever attempted. We're going up to the very top of the office building where an otherwise somewhat normal tower is about to transform essentially into a glass ski slope. This challenging roof begins 760 feet up on one of the highest job sites in the city. Samer, tell me where we're standing right now. Now we are here at floor 57. And it's at this point where the building changes from being a somewhat traditional office building into this new ring beam building. Yeah. Because a lot of the buildings you build that you see in Abu Dhabi, there's a flat roof. A flat roof. And you're done. Yeah. Building an angled roof also means planning for the future. Glass skyscrapers require constant cleaning and maintenance. Now on flat roofs, crews access the facade using window washing platforms. To handle these blade-shaped roofs, an engineering first, something called a ring beam. 
Its built-in 220-ton steel track is secured by 258 anchors, allowing two maintenance carts to glide around all 656 feet of the perimeter, giving crews full access to the glass facade. Now to embed each anchor into the ring beam, workers climb out to the edge of the tower, 800 feet up. Let's tie off something, coming down. As I'm coming down the outside of this beam, what I want you to see is right there. Look at that. That is the embed, that huge steel attachment that we're going to drop in and anchor into this ring beam. It's coming down. Okay, we got it. Now, as you look at this beam, you can see just the sheer density of rebar. There is so much steel in this thing because this is not just a beam capping a tower, but it's actually the structural element that's going to hold up these 17-ton building cleaning units. And because there's so much rebar, it's actually quite a pain to get this to fit. Get it in there. If they're off by even a few inches, the maintenance carts could derail and topple off of the tower. To embed these 287-pound anchors flush against the angled surface... Oh, the chain block has to come in. ...the team squeezes it in with a chain block. As he cranks the chain block, the chain on this part of the steel tightens, and we are slowly moving this piece into alignment. More than 4,500 pieces of rebar form the ring beam, creating a web so dense that the chain block alone is not enough to embed the anchor. No, it's not going. Not going. Instead, they try a hammer to move it the final few inches. Here it is. All right, so now, okay, we have our tool. We have Thor's device, we have the hammer. And it's with this hammer that Hardenixen is gonna smack that embed and hopefully get it into alignment. Hardenixen, scalpel. All right. Oh my God. Oh, that's it, it's happening. Hunchback of Abu Dhabi. For who the bell tolled? It tolled for Hardenixen. Is it moving? It's still stuck, huh? So, so the issue is right now the steel of the embed is pushed in, but it's pressed tight up against some rebar. We have to rotate it about four inches, and there's basically no give. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how we're going to pull this off. To shift this anchor the final four inches. The team tries one last tool, able to pull with 14 tons of force. Automixing came up with a kind of a sick idea. We have the crane putting tension on the lower side of the embedment and the chain block putting tension on the upper side, using both almost like a tandem lift to both lift and rotate the piece. We're going back to the chain block. All right. Well, after quite a bit of haranguing, this embedment is finally in place. Thanks to Harnixing solution, a chain block plus the crane combined got this thing lined up, flush, and ready to close up this ring beam and pour some concrete. Permanently binding these anchors to the ring beam takes 528 gallons of concrete. Getting that amount up to the top is a major challenge. Typically, crews pump concrete up through a pressurized tube. Here, the 800-foot-long tube required would hold over 1,300 gallons of concrete, way more than twice the amount needed for the pour. Instead, the team uses a crane to hoist up individual vats, holding a manageable 264 gallons, allowing workers to pour each 22-foot section of the roof without overflowing the job site. This is something you just don't see that often. A flying bucket of concrete. All right, here we go. Up in the bucket. Get down. And a bucket strapped to a crane. Tie off to the belt. Up and away we go. Yeah, he's good. Bye, guys. Oh, this is it. We're going up and over. We're off the edge of the tower right now. Oh, my God. Okay, so I'm hanging off the side of a skyscraper strapped to a little bucket with a tub of concrete. The goal is to get this concrete out from this vat and into the ring beam. Okay, are you in position? You want some concrete? Left us up. Here it comes. Coming down. But 
I slowly open this valve, I can modulate the speed of the concrete coming out. One more. OK. The idea is to get it out as quickly as possible, because they have trucks waiting, but not to go so quickly that we overflow the formwork. With 20 more sections left to pour, the crew will finish this incredible roof in just two months' time. The ring beam is now chalk full of concrete. One of the more complicated aspects of the entire office building is done. I'm getting down on the tower and done for the night. Coming up, bringing together priceless artifacts from around the world. Give me some support back here. To build one of the largest and most elaborate Arabian markets on the planet. Warm here in Abu Dhabi. What are we in, like the desert? Dubai and Abu Dhabi are oftentimes thought about interchangeably. But the truth is it's more like opposite sides of the same coin. I mean, they're sister cities from the same country, but they have really different visions. In Dubai, they've had one of the biggest building booms in history, creating man-made islands, an indoor ski park, and the world's tallest skyscraper. But the truth is, since the economic collapse, a lot of those theme parks go unvisited, and a lot of those hotel rooms are empty. Now, here in Abu Dhabi, they're trying to do things a bit differently. Instead of building enormous attractions to garner the world's attention, they're rebuilding from the inside out. For over a thousand years, the cultural center of Abu Dhabi has been the bustling open-air Arabic markets called souks. To bring this ancient tradition to Central Market, architects designed a retail space unlike any in the world. Rather than make a traditional Western-style shopping mall, the architects came up with this, a modern reimagination of the traditional Arabic market. 156,000 square feet, costing over $160 million. This redefined souk rivals some of the largest shopping malls ever. Its most modern feature, a state-of-the-art retractable roof. 1,800 square feet of bronze and steel that open and shut, allowing this outdoor market tradition inside for the first time. So the original souk, which were a series of kind of one-story buildings that were all open air with a shade above them, this actually physically recreates that condition. Yeah, I mean, the souks generally are marketplaces, so they've grown up in streets and stalls and the traditionally open air, maybe with some shading. But if the weather gets nice, mechanically, the roof literally opens up. The roof opens, and for the cooler months of the year, it's an outdoor space. Now, when it gets warmer, you just close the roof and you treat it like you would a traditional mount. This complex roof defends against the desert's violent sandstorms and temperatures topping 110 degrees, protecting the souks' lavish veneer. So often when you look at some of these massive new developments, there's big, shiny gold walls and marble and waterfalls, gigantic yeah. yeah. And That's different. That's, the, that's what we want. We want something different. Yes, different, but to keep the sense of history. I'm from New Jersey. We have a lot of shopping malls. This doesn't look anything much. like our shopping malls in New Jersey. <laughs> yes. The souk is wrapped in over 76,000 square feet of handcrafted wood. If laid end to end, it would cover the Golden Gate Bridge three times. Once you enter into the building, before you actually cross the threshold to see this redesigned souk, the first thing you experience is this right here. Two walls of handcrafted traditional Arabic tile made in the exact same way they did it hundreds of years ago. All six entries are lined with nearly 50,000 tiles imported 4,000 miles away from Morocco, along with the artisans to install them. And so even the guys you have working on the Moroccan tile have come from Morocco to come here to build this. Exactly. They are the same people with the same the material itself from Morocco. Same people, same material, same process. Exactly. Despite the incredible high-tech nature of this project, in order to make these amazing tile walls, it all starts right here with two guys working by hand. And if you look here, you can see on the floor, there's actually essentially a drawing describing the entire pattern of that tile wall. The star pattern design, the Seal of Muhammad, has been a staple of Islamic art for over 15 centuries. 
With 64 panels to assemble by hand, it'll take workers nine months to complete. Here they come, here they come. More of the missing white ones. It does kind of have that uh, fourth grade arts and crafts feeling, you know, when you used to make mosaic tiles as a kid. Except the trick is, you gotta get them right face down, lest you cast this in concrete, lift it up, and realize you messed the pattern up. It takes four days for this fragile panel to be fully cast in concrete. Ready to be wheeled, 65 feet to the Sook's main entrance. Okay. Now keep in mind we have to be relatively careful with this because the cast of concrete is about three quarters of an inch, lots of individual pieces, so if we move it could buckle, it could crack. Very carefully. Oy. Ooh, bad sound, bad sound. Every time it goes over an electrical cord or a little bump, you get this worry that it's gonna snap. Uh, guys, look at this. Wait, guys, guys, okay. See how tight we are right here. Rather than move the scaffolding, we're just gonna, gonna sneak through. Up, up, right, yeah? We're in trouble. Give me some support back here. Wait, one, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, well. Okay, so we're now up against the concrete wall, which is a huge first step. And now the idea is to get it shimmed up to exactly the right height on the lower edge of it right there. Up and in? Oh, yeah, yeah. Up? Oh, 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 okay, okay. Oh. And you can see as we bring it closer and closer, the goal is to line up our star shape right here with a notch from the previous tile. Using wood shims, workers align this 550 pound panel flush with the previous slab. So now we have the two panels now lined up. Next step is knock out one of the tiles, drill this whole thing in, and she's up. Once secured, the team covers each wall anchor with a matching tile to create one seamless 36 foot long mosaic. So look at that, something absolutely amazing that you don't see on most modern skyscraper construction sites. Handcrafted individual tiles, hand laid, cast into panels that will create this amazing traditional entrance as you go from the old into the new. Beyond these tiled entryways, the Sook opens up to an even more lavish space, where 3,000 handcrafted wood panels, costing over $13 million, wrap the entire market. So the inside of the Sook are covered in seven different types of timber panels made of this right here, which is a Brazilian redwood. Now, there are a series of different designs. Some are rectangles, some are squares, and others have this amazing Arabic design. And today, we're gonna take six of these guys and cover up this entire wall. So, we're gonna hang these on the wall, right? They're hanging like a screen. Yeah, yes. I will show you how to hang the screens. Let's do it. Each panel weighs 220 pounds. Two. All right, here we go. And is hung by four brackets, two on each side. Oh, look at that. Right on the brackets. Do you feel like there's more guys on the job than there need to be? We could do this alone, you and me. Two guys, two guys. Oh, but this is too very heavy. It's too heavy? Yeah, it's heavy. It's not that heavy. It's too much weight. Too much weight? Yeah, it's not hollow, it's the solids. Come on, come on. Okay, so five guys will do it. So two guys to lift, two guys to align, one guy to wear a pink shirt. Uh oh. Okay. Looking good. Watch the fingers in the back. Six panels will cover this section of wall. Coming up. Coming up. The most challenging to hang is at the roof, over 20 feet up. More dudes hiding out. Three more guys. Okay. What's your name? Pashudeb. Pashudeb? I'm Danny. Good to meet you, Pashudeb. Okay, so it's myself, Pashudeb, two other guys, seven below me, and then four below that. We're gonna put up the last Brazilian wood panel. Teamwork, okay. Tell me something. How come both those guys have this on? You and me, no. Now you too? Well, now it's a conspiracy, really. Everyone is protected against some sort of airborne agent, except for me. Do you have a harness? Check. Gas mask? Check. What does Danny have? Donut. Where's mine? He knows why. You're laughing. You know, I don't have one. Final piece. With 3,400 square feet still left to cover, Central Market is just four months away from giving residents a modern take on an ancient tradition. Oh! 
Levels are checked, six panel is in, the wall is clad, all 17 dudes came together to make this happen. Well done, my friend. It's warm here in Abu Dhabi. What are we in, like the desert? Coming up, building the tallest residence in the world means overcoming 50 mile per hour winds at the top. The wind has got to be so hard. We are so high right now. Abu Dhabi's new central market will house the tallest residential tower on the planet. Featuring nearly 600 new downtown apartments, a penthouse soaring over 1,000 feet up, and the world's highest swimming pool at the top. Stuart, the residential tower is going to be 1,250 feet tall, making it the tallest pure residence in the world and certainly the tallest building in Abu Dhabi. I mean, clearly it's prime real estate. You've got all the things you need to make a high-rise building work, but then all around the perimeter, you've got these great spaces, these great rooms, and fantastic views. So although the building is incredibly tall, when you look at the apartments and the bedrooms and the kitchens and the bathrooms, they're really well-designed apartments. Yeah, they are. And I think, you know, it'll be great if you can have an apartment in that high-rise. To fit all the comforts of home into such a narrow four-block radius, the skyscraper had to be a slender 123 feet wide, requiring an innovative way for residents to climb all 88 stories. Basic rule of thumb when it comes to skyscrapers. The taller the building, the more elevators are required. And that makes sense, right? Because you have more square footage, which means you have more people. With more people, you need more elevators to get them to the top of the building. In most skyscrapers, elevators are clustered in the central core. Here, that would mean a 110 by 102 foot wide space practically filling this thin tower. So to avoid cramped quarters, architects moved four of the elevators to the outside of the building, creating additional space in each apartment, all the while giving residents a stunning view on their way up. As opposed to a traditional interior concrete elevator core, this new perimeter core is framed with steel beams on the outside of the tower. Right now, a team is installing those very beams 730 feet up. So the plan is to do something uh, I've at least never done before. We're going to track a beam going up. So simultaneously, as that piece of steel is being lifted into place, I myself, with my trusty cohort, are going to ride the man basket up alongside the steel and erect it. Azar, I'm Danny. Hi, I'm Danny. Azar, I have an important question for you. Okay. Have you ever gone up in the man basket before? No, no. <laughs> it's my first time. First time? Yeah. How do you feel? Uh, I am excited. All right, so now I have both of my lifelines attached to a canvas strap, which is attached to a shackle, which is attached to a tower crane. So even if the steel bucket goes south of the border, myself and Azar will be just kind of suspended, hanging like yo-yos in the wind. To create this over 1,000 foot tall perimeter elevator core, a nearly five ton beam is welded to the outside edge of each level, followed by two smaller support beams that secure each suspended piece of steel to the existing concrete floor. And we're off. And you know what one of the really sad realities is? The building behind me, one of the tallest buildings in Abu Dhabi, the tallest residence in the world, still another about 500 feet above my head. How are you feeling? I'm feeling a little good. Look at it, it's rotating in the air. The crane operator is getting it into position and they're gonna swing it in. Right there, what you're looking at, they are framing out the structural perimeter of this skyscraper. Once installed, this outer steel blocks workers' access to the final two beams. So to finish this level, crews have to guide each piece down through the top of the elevator core. So they got the first piece in place. I'm now heading back down in the basket to rig up the second piece to send it up, over, and into place. One piece down, two more to go. With hurricane force winds at the top, this is the most complicated lift on the project. We're moving fast now. Count them off, there go the floors. Oh, we're going up and over. We are going up and over. That's the very top of the building. All right, baby, bring us in. Bring us in. Oh, oh, <laughs> The wind has got to be so hard. We are so high right now. <laughs> Hold the 
helmet, maybe it will fly. Yes, my helmet, my life, my helmet. Gold one, go for it, gold one, go for it. The wind is out of control. Oh my goodness. It's coming down. Top of the tower. All right, we're down. So once we got above the tower at about 1,250 feet, we couldn't get dropped onto the building because the wind was so strong that he couldn't control the basket being lowered. So unfortunately, we were actually out there just dangling in the wind. Uh, that's when I, I got scared. Me too. All right, let's go get the beam. Get it there. This way. Let's go to get this beam down to workers 24 floors below, the crew has to guide it through a narrow one and a half foot gap. It's right here, perched off the side of the tower, where they've cut a hole, and it's through this hole and through that hole above me where we're gonna thread the beam and drop it into place. Oh, here it comes over, it's coming over. Oh, it's amazing, you can just try to keep this thing straight. The wind still has it. It is really blowing the wind. Okay, they got it, it's coming down through the hole. It's coming down. Now you get a sense of why this is such a precision operation. It's coming down, it's coming down, right there. All right, we got hands on it. Keep it tight. Oh, watch this edge, watch this edge, watch this edge, please. Keep it controlled. That was hardcore, but we got it. All hands are off the beam. She looks good, going down through the shaft. And now we're gonna thread this needle 24 stories straight down to a set of iron workers waiting to install this piece. Moving these four elevators to the perimeter keeps the central core a narrow 56 feet which creates more space for the residents, but leaves the tower vulnerable to powerful desert winds. Very tall, slender skyscrapers basically act like gigantic flagpoles, meaning they can sway back and forth in the wind, which is fine if you're carrying a flag, but not great if you're carrying an apartment about 1,200 feet in the air. Wide central elevator cores transfer heavy wind loads down into the foundation, thereby minimizing sway. But with this slender core, engineers needed something called outriggers to help reinforce the tower. Three two-story diagonal webs of rebar that transfer loads from the core to the perimeter walls, thereby widening the tower's stance. The last of these outriggers is being installed on the 80th floor. Today, we're gonna to take the elevator core and through this diagonal bracing, connect it from the center to the outside of the tower so all those wind forces get transferred from up here out to the perimeter and then down into the foundation. So, me and Mohammed, it's a big tower. Big tower, no problem. No problem? No problem. Made from over 100 tons of rebar, this outrigger will stabilize the tower's final eight floors, the most vulnerable to wind. So what we're doing is taking a piece of rebar so long that it's going from the very top of the elevator core through the wall and then down into this transfer. This gives us structural continuity. Continuity? Continuity. Continuity. Each piece of rebar is 13 feet long and weighs over 160 pounds. So I have three guys up top actually physically in the elevator core moving the rebar while we're moving it down on this level. There it is. Okay, so here, here comes the rebar right here. Okay, bring it in. It's so dense, you can't even get it through. Over here, or here? Down, down. Down, down? Down. Yeah, okay. Up, up, up. Okay, up, up. Yep, I got it. Let's see, what I gotta do is I gotta jack this. Yeah, come here. Come on through. Come on. Come on. There you go. There you go. Each piece is one and a half inches thick. Way too big for typical rebar ties. So instead, they're bound together using steel couplers. There it is. Nice. Where this man go? First up, get him lined up by hand. And then when no human hand can go any further, what do you do? The wrench comes in. There it is. Bring it in and rotate. Bring it in and rotate. So each time I rotate this coupler, I am doing essentially what its name implies, right? I am coupling two individual pieces of rebar. This is where two become one. It's good? No. Oh, more? No, more. Full time. <laughs> Full time. <laughs> it takes 20 twists of the wrench to create one solid 30 foot long diagonal brace. More? More? Full time. Full time. Half time? 
full-time. No, full-time. No. Full 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 I thought you said half-tie earlier. That's why I was only going with half my strength and effort. It'll take the crew 35 more days to finish up this final outrigger, able to withstand winds over 75 miles per hour. Finish? Finished? Finished. Finished! It's finished! Okay, we got one down. There's only like 1,600 more to go on this side, and there's three more sides. Coming up, fighting off vicious desert sandstorms with an armor unlike any other. So the idea that it's actually made from sand means that it can actually survive in a desert. But first, what's the fastest skyscraper elevator in the world? The answer, after the break. Here is your trivia answer. The world's fastest skyscraper elevator is in Taipei 101. At 38 miles per hour, it moves five floors every second. The harsh, arid desert wreaks havoc in Abu Dhabi. The biggest threat? Sandstorms, where gale force winds can dump over 200 tons of debris in just two days, quickly weathering the city's concrete buildings. So to protect Central Market's unconventional shopping mall, architects wrapped the facade in a new material, actually made from sand. So, Ragadish, tell me about what's inside this GRC panel. This is the glass reinforced cement. So it's glass reinforced cement. Yeah. It's the sand, cement, and fiber. So the idea that it's actually made from the desert, it's made from sand, means that it can actually survive in the desert. Yeah. If you see the plaster also, it's all dirty. It looks terrible. Look at that building right there. It's a white panel building, and it looks filthy because it's covered in Abu Dhabi desert sand. Yes. So the beauty of this system is that when the wind, as it does right now, blows sand onto it, it doesn't get damaged, yeah. it doesn't look dirty, yeah. it doesn't look old. Natural. 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 Because of the use of sand inside the panels, the facade won't degrade during a sand storm. But to fully ensure it doesn't trap windswept debris in its gritty texture, workers polish each panel down to a smooth finish. So I am here in a moving gondola with my two comrades, Laden and Jagadish. And what we're doing right now is preparing the very last steps of the GRC, the glass reinforced panels. And when you're this close, it's really amazing. Look at this. You can start to see the detail of the Islamic patterns, the rectangles, the triangles, the squares. And the amazing thing is it's made from cement and sand. Polishing all 3,100 panels releases harmful debris into the air. So to keep workers from inhaling it, they first apply water. So basically, a little bit of water, and that's it. All right, so let's wash. It always does surprise me, though, when you have a building as large as this with over 3,100 individual panels, that the process by which they ultimately clean it is by hand. Typical flat facades are sanded by machine. Here, the pattern design with crevices five and a half inches deep forces the team to polish an area nearly the size of two football fields by hand with a sanding block. No cladding, no fancy system. Just a rough texture. You smooth it down, get the edges just right. Regadish, how's it look? Looking good? Yeah, good, good. Good, good. Good, good. good. Yeah. Clean GRC, right? Yeah. Yeah. Clean GRC. GRC. For you and me, <laughs> everybody loves GRC. 3,100 panels, and the way you see them today, thanks to that amazing sand inside of them, is exactly the way this facade's gonna look in five or 10 years' time. Beyond sandstorms, the building's facades face another more constant threat, the ruthless desert sun. As it beats down on the city over 350 days a year, Temperatures can top 110 degrees, a problem for Central Market's three skyscrapers, which are wrapped in 400,000 square feet of glass panels. The key to designing great office space is bringing in as much natural daylight as possible to the workspaces. But the challenge is in Abu Dhabi, the sun can be so brutal, it can heat up those working spaces and make them untenable. Now here in the office tower, they've come up with an amazing solution that gives them both open glass walls as well as combat solar radiation. Something called a double facade. Quite literally, not just one, but two facades. 
A single glass facade can heat up to over 170 degrees in direct sunlight, roasting interior spaces, making them expensive to cool. Central Market's unique double facade adds a second piece of glass, creating an 8-inch gap. A vent at the base allows cool inside air into the cavity, cooling both panes of glass before a fan at the top forces it out. This flow keeps offices inside a comfortable 68 degrees, all at two-thirds the cost. Luca, you actually have a kind of a funny challenge because right. everyone wants a great view, but you also don't want to sit and crank up air conditioning to fight the Abu Dhabi sun. Yeah, exactly. Having this double skin with the air throwing through, uh, chilling the cavity continuously, this glass will be always be at the same temperature of the inside. All because there's eight inches of space between two yeah, facades. Yeah, exactly. I like this wall. I like it too. It's a good looking wall. It's a good looking wall. With two panels of glass, each window weighs more than a pickup truck, making these some of the heaviest ever installed. I'm ready. That man's ready. His forearms are certainly ready. Yeah! Popeye from China. All right. Much like washing your windshield, the first step in the glass installation process is to get a beautiful, streakless, clean edge before we take this piece of glass and install it. We ready to go? Look at that. That, by the way, is an example of perfection right there. A couple drops had to go off. His forearms were not happy with it. Now they are. We are set. We're going to lift this piece up and make it part of this facade. Come on. On this busy downtown job site, there is no room for tower cranes to swing around all sides of the building. Instead, the team turns to a monorail crane perched 17 floors up to guide each 13-foot-tall panel into place around the entire curved facade. Okay, so now the trolley is out. We have some men slowly easing the panel out. And as we speak, 1,500 pounds, 6 feet wide, 13 feet tall, is about to get launched out of a building. As this swings out of the building, the bottom is going to want to swing right away. The goal, keep this tight. Don't go with it. Okay, here we go. Push. Oh, we're going out. We're going out. Here it, here it comes. To secure it to the tower, workers anchored the panel to the concrete floor slabs using four brackets. There's two teams, us here and two guys above. They're going to make the first connection up top and then slowly drop it down to us to make the final connection right over here. That's it. Okay. The shackles have now come off, which means this piece of glass is freestanding inside the facade, which lets you have amazing views out while all the while keeping at bay that brutal Abu Dhabi sun. Coming up... Finishing the tallest elevator in Abu Dhabi. Let's go, let's go, everybody out. From a platform that will float higher than the Chrysler building. Look at that, it's like a spaceship. In just two years, Central Market will be home to nearly a thousand new residents, over 300 shops, and 100 offices. Now to finish this massive city within a city on time, crews on the apartment tower are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and adopting some innovative time-saving measures. One of the most unique aspects of the residential tower is that they have elevators that are located on the perimeter of the building. But in order to build those perimeter elevators, they have to erect a temporary scaffolding located outside the tower. Normally, scaffolding is constructed from the ground up. But if this were done on the residential tower, it would block crews from installing curtain wall below, delaying construction by two months. Instead, a floating platform is jumped from one floor to the next, leaving space below clear for additional work. Right now, crews are attempting this difficult lift on the 58th floor. Today, they're going to take this temporary platform and lift it up one more story. What's under here? Nothing is there. Air. Only space. Right? Nothing. You can go to ground level. From 58 straight to ground. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of feet. Yeah. <laughs> are you scared? Sure. <clears throat> yeah. It's high up. So 
Just to explain, what I'm standing on right now is a temporary piece of bridge steel, essentially, spanning both sides of the tower. What we've got to do is erect the next level of outside elevator steel, which means we have to get this thing up. So there's a crane above my head right now, which we are going to attach to this formwork and jack it up. Perched 1,300 feet up, the tower crane lowers four chains, each capable of supporting two tons. All right, so this is the chain. Wow, coming down from the tower crane, about 30 some odd stores above me. We have to connect this chain to the platform on which we're standing. Yeah. All right, where to? Secured to all four corners, these shackles ensure that the platform is level during the lift. Good, locked, good, tight, we're happy. That's one connection, we need to make three more. And then this platform is gonna start flying out over Abu Dhabi. One down, three to go? Yeah. Let's go. Shackle up, shackle up, shackle up. Once attached, the crane adds tension to the chains, balancing the five-ton platform before it's lifted 12 feet to the next level. We're gonna send this flying, are we ready? Yeah. It would look so cool for the camera if I could just ride it. It would be just like Styles in Teen Wolf when he was surfing on top of the van. He got on top and he just rode the van. Yeah. But instead of it being a van and an 80s classic Michael J. Fox movie, it would be the platform workstation. Yeah. Is that an option? No. Jumping one floor every two days. In less than two months, this temporary platform will reach 1,063 feet, the top of the tallest scenic elevator in the Middle East. This is the 58th time you've done this. I've already jumped this one, yeah. 58th for him, but the first for me. Everybody ready? There it is. 58! Done. Let's rock and roll. Let's get this thing flying. Everyone, out. Let's go. Let's go. Everybody out. Safety first. Safety first. With winds gusting upwards of 20 miles per hour, this platform acts like a giant five-ton sail. So to keep it from crashing into the tower, the crane has to swing the structure 16 feet out from the building's edge. Look at that. Look at that. It is out, disengaged from the building. Crane has the weight. It is now floating 600 plus feet over Abu Dhabi. God, look at that. It's like a spaceship. Once the platform is level with the next floor, workers perched on the outside edge of the tower guide the structure back into the elevator core. So we're now at the 59th level right here. You can see the piece that made it to where we are. And with this tagline, we're going to slowly bring it in as the crane booms up and slides this piece into position. Here it comes. With this jack now extended, it's put pressure on the beam. Yeah. This temporary piece of steel this. is locked in locked. place. Damn. So the jumping is done, the workstation's in place, yes. we can now begin our work on the next level of perimeter elevator steel. With the crane now detached, you can see the jumping formwork has done its job, jumped from the 58th floor up to the 59th floor, where we can now begin steel erection on the next level of a perimeter elevator that will give you a view of that. When complete, this scenic elevator will shuttle Abu Dhabi's newest residents from a traditional Arabian marketplace up to some of the most innovative apartments. The first step in a $200 billion transformation from desert oasis into modern metropolis for the millions of people flocking to this burgeoning city. When a city redevelops, there are really two paths it can take. You can reject the past, look to the future, and create a modern city of glass and steel like Hong Kong or Tokyo. Alternatively, you can cling to that past, take a more historical approach, and remake your city in the image of what came before you. And you see examples of that all over Europe. But if you come to Abu Dhabi, I think you'll find a kind of fascinating combination of the two. You have the people who are aware of their culture and tradition, but they're not bound by it. They want to create a new and modern city, but do so in a way that's informed by their history and even enhanced by their climate. And I think Central Market represents a new model in urban development, one that builds for a clear and new future, but all the while never forgetting the foundation on which that future is built.